All right, welcome back, uh, everybody, to another edition of Mayday Monday. This Mayday Monday is coming to you um, after we've recorded. We weren't able to get it out on Monday. I hope you weren't waiting for the first Monday of the month to get this out. Um, there's been a lot going on in the Mayday Monday headquarters, and then we had to uh, get everybody's schedule to line up to get to get to get together here. So just a, just a review again. Um, if you were here with us last month, you guys remember that we talked about we talked about um, the the Colorain, Ohio. Um, here, let me show you a picture here. Colorain, Ohio. We had um, shoot. We had Robin Brockstroman and uh, my bad. Robin Robin Brockstroman and Brian Shira. Uh, they were the two who. Um, were killed in a basement fire. Um, we talked a little bit about um, some some skills you could use to maybe rescue someone who falls into a basement. And we had a great talk with uh, Chief Allen uh, Walls there from Colorain Township. If you didn't see that one, go back. It's a uh, YouTube uh, fire engineering links. You can get that and uh, go back and review it. Again, um, some of that stuff that we've seen uh, so many times here with the Mayday Monday podcast is that uh, fire behavior, the fire behavior is, um, we have to really consider that. Uh, the importance of 360, the importance of flowing water, all of those things that um, are going to you know, be, be in our favor, really going to set us up for success on the fires. So again, get back, get out there, look at that. If you do, please send me in uh, pictures of you and your crew doing some of the skills. Uh, this is kind of cool with the hose. You can bend the hose down in pop the guy back out of the hole and uh, practice that. Um, since we've been, since our last podcast, since our last podcast, we've had um, several line of duty deaths in the fire service. Um, we had seven that we count right now in USFA's calculation, West Virginia. There was a firefighter killed in West Virginia. He was, uh, it was a vehicle collision. It was a firefighter uh, killed in Delaware she was struck by a vehicle directing traffic. Uh, Georgia, it was a firefighter. Um, this one's a real shame. 20 year old, 20 year old kids first night in the firehouse and uh, he passed away in his sleep. Um, Arizona, a COVID death. We had a cardiac, a cardiac arrest in Alabama, another COVID death in Wyoming and a COVID death in Texas. So uh, to this month, we're going to bring us back to uh, the cause of death in this month's May Day Monday is uh, one of the leading killers of firefighters in the fire service. We see it year, year in and year out, right, that cardiac issues uh, continue to be a killer for us. Um, this month, we're going to talk to um, some members who are helping my fire department, the D.C. Fire Department, to really kind of uh, fix some of these issues and get us to be um, uh, fire fit, if you will, right? To be, be ready for the firefight, ready for everything. So with us here, again, to talk a little bit about this stuff. First, we got Dabney Hudson. You guys might know Dabney. Dabney's the uh, president of Local 36, which represents the DCFD. Uh, Scott, you wanna, I see you, what do you got, the kids in the background? No, 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 not today. I got them in the basement. So uh, hopefully they'll stay quiet through dinner time. But I appreciate you having me on today, Tony, and look forward to a, a good conversation and uh, getting some information out there that hopefully will, uh, if it helps one person, uh, you know, we're, we're doing the right thing. So appreciate you doing this and uh, having me on today. So I, don't, I haven't talked too much about the D.C. Fire Department with the, with the viewers here. So why don't you tell me a little bit about uh, the fire department? I know, again, you're... Um, you have a few years there. Um, how many members are there? How many do you serve? Uh, engines, trucks, that kind of thing? Yeah, so, uh, you know, a pretty busy urban department uh, serving a population of, uh, you know, roughly 700,000 over uh, about 66 square miles. Obviously, the nation's capital, most people know. Uh, protect a myriad of, of uh, different types of structures, residences, things we respond to. We've got a wharf. We've got you know, sovereign territories and all of our uh, embassies. We've got government facilities, protests, you know, you name it, we, we respond to it. Uh, 33 engines, 16 ladder trucks, three heavy rescues, hazmat unit, uh, you know, fire boat, uh, pretty typical uh, department, you know, department for an urban, uh, urban jurisdiction. 
uh, we're staffed fairly well, four on the engines, five on the trucks, five on the rescues. So uh, pretty decent, uh, you know, staffing factor. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, we've got about 1800 members, give or take, uh, you know, serving a, a daytime population that swells non COVID time, you know, over a million and a half, two million people uh, that come to the city a day. So uh, unique challenges that any type of city department uh, would expect. Um, and, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, run the myriad of incidents. So uh, the potential is always there. Um, that's why things like this definitely help to bring awareness and, uh, and educate uh, the members. Uh, you know, yeah, the yeah. And this is uh, right. This is an issue here that we're going to talk about, which affects every fire department. Right. Um, again, high rise stuff. Not everybody can kind of can, can kind of get into that, right? There's some places that don't have high rises. We only have what, like 14 story high rises. We don't have crazy things. So, you know, we can, we can kind of think about high rise, uh, big box stores, right? That, that kind of, there's some places that don't have that. Everybody, every firefighter out there listening has got a heart, we hope, right? And, and we want to take care of it. We want to take care of this stuff. So um, before we get too much into that, um, Kevin, you've worked with Kevin, right? Yeah, I did work with Kevin. I was uh, very fortunate to have worked for Kevin. Uh, worked for and with. Um, it's tough to say. Like he, he was one of the good guys. You know, I mean, everybody says that, and everybody wants to say that. But Kevin legitimately was. Uh, I mean, he was one of the best of the best, right? I mean, uh, couldn't have been a better story. Born and raised in the city, grew up in the city. Always wanted to be a you know a firefighter. As a kid, you know, going to the firehouses in the city. Um, and, you know, was it some of our busiest places, you know, in the city, you know, uh, tons of fire duty was at our premier companies. Uh, you know, uh, he, he walked the walk and he talked the talk and he was one of the people that, uh, one of those guys that everybody looked up to, he was a kind of a natural born leader. He was, um, he was a quiet leader. I like to tell people, right. Like you just wanted to, he made people better just being around him. Right. He always did the right thing for the right reasons. And people tended to fall in line with that, um, just cause that's who he was, right. That was, that was, uh, that was what Kevin was all about, which made it even more difficult, uh, when he passed away, you know, that was, uh, that was not the guy that was going to pass away on the fire. Right. Like, uh, I, I don't know how many people said that. And everybody always says that, unfortunately, when one of these things happens, but it was like, man, I couldn't believe it was him, you know? Um, so that's what made this one. I don't want to say more sensational because I think that takes away from who Kevin was, but, um, I, I think it opened a lot of people's eyes and started a lot of conversations um, after his death. He was young. Uh, his, you know, his cousin had passed away from a heart attack, another line of duty death. Right. Um, so it was just it was, you know, you, you kind of put all that stuff together and it, it was a, it was a real eye opening experience for everybody. Yeah, I, I would say um, I when I talk to people about Kevin, I say he's like the poster child. Right. That's the guy we would put on the poster. And there's a great picture we're going to look at later, right? Where he's standing in front of that, whatever they had a fire. And he, he looks, he looks the part. And, and of course we know that he didn't just look the part that he played the part. Right. And I guess, um, you know, he, he really grew up in some good places. Let me share my screen again here. I want to show, uh, show some of these things. This is, this is Kevin, right? This is Kevin. And this is all, this kind of spans everything. Uh, the top left picture there, this is right after he was appointed to Engine 6. He was appointed to Engine 6 a little bit before I was appointed to Engine 16, which, you know, they run a lot together. So I got to, I got to be, I got to see him on fires. I got to, you know, to, uh, to be, be worried about them, right? Because that was definitely, uh, um, you were, you had to get, a, you had to be ready because if you weren't, right, 6 Engine was going to be right there and would take, would, would take the fire. So, I um, mean, Kevin and Kevin was, uh, was no slouch. He was definitely a fireman. Um, the middle picture here, this is his, him on graduation day. Um, again, product of our cadet program, right? Kind of product of the cadet program, went to, went to, went to DC schools. Um, young kid here. Um, that looks exactly like his, his son who we're going to see in a second, right? Other pictures. Uh, he went from six engine to rescue squad one, another busy place. Um, when he was promoted, he went to what 15 engine. I know he was there. And then he even served some time at the training school. So, uh, you know, kind of that selfless thing where, you know, you know how many guys try to get away from day work and, and Kevin didn't, right. He saw it's part of his job and, and went down there and gave, gave it his all there, just like he did in e everywhere he went. 
one of the big things that we know about Kevin is uh, he's a big family guy. Uh, fire family, right? Fire family, which which was um, kind of conducive in that firehouse where he was, Engine 6, Truck 4, right? The big house which is really known for for tough, uh, tight, tight groups, um, all four shifts they have. And, um, and Kevin, Kevin took that home too, right? He, he took that home. This is a great picture of his, uh, his boys here. This is his older, older son. This is his younger son, Vaughn. And you see uh, Vaughn over here. He's, uh, falling right in line, right? Um, he went to, got appointed to engine six. Um, and now he's a wagon driver, much like Kevin, uh, Kevin did that when he was at six engine. So he really, um, I mean, everything about Kevin was, was awesome. The smile, uh, right. He had that nickname light bulb. If you guys watch a movie, there's a movie out there with a, a character named light bulb. And that's what they equate. Uh, they gave that Kevin that nickname. So look at that. I mean, he was definitely, um, definitely the firefighters firefighter and even a, a, a great man too. Right. It, 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 he really, um, uh, that's what I guess we didn't really know what was going on a lot either. Right. Because um, there was some underlying health issues that uh, kind of came out with the investigation um, after his death. Kevin was a 24 year veteran at the time of his death, which he died on May the 6th, just a couple days from now in back in 2015. Um and May, May is a pretty tough month for D.C. Fire Department. Um, and, and, of course, everybody, a lot of people know about the Cherry Road incident where we lost the two firefighters, uh, Tony Phillips and Lou Matthews, and some other members were severely injured there. Uh, back in, uh, if we lost a firefighter in May in 1950, we lost a firefighter in May 1930. And in May of, 19, of 1896, a collapse at a fire killed five firefighters in one fire. But in 2015, like, uh, like, like what Scott was saying, we lost an, like an icon in the D.C. Fire Department. Kevin McRae, again, 24-year veteran at the time of his death. Um, he rose through the ranks. He got appointed to Engine 6. And then like that picture at the bottom left, um, he was a, a lieutenant platoon commander at Engine 6 at the time of his death. He came in that morning, um, like usual, 4.30 in the morning, relieved. They, they got early relief there. And his day started. They were out on a medical run when the fire call came in and um, they jumped on there and the chief, yeah, come on in six, six got there pretty quick. Um, you can see from the picture, I mean, it's a pretty good fire going here on the, the ninth floor of this 10 story building. For some reason, Kevin jumped off, right? And he went into the, the building across the street. Now, again, engine six being as they are and his, his company is, Pretty tight. His guys get off with their stuff and they go into the fire building, which the engine was pointed at the fire building. Kevin got off, went next door again. Un, you know, is that an indication of something going on? And again, we, we don't we don't really know now. But Kevin goes into that building. Uh, his guys and, and the other companies go into the fire building. Kevin comes back down and sends, gets back in the elevator, goes to the top and meets up with his company. After he meets up with his company and they put the fire out. He comes back downstairs, descends the stairs, and as he's coming out of the building, he, he falls down, drops dead. He has a massive heart attack. And again, the investigation found that uh, there was some underlying medical conditions uh, that contributed to this, to his death that day. He had hypertension. He had hyperlipidemia, which is like fatty deposits, right, in the, in the liver. Uh, he had abnormal EKGs, sinus tachycardia obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, Kevin was labeled as obese, but you know, that's what we all can get that label depending on your frame and you know how they get it. But there's a lot going on there. And um, Kevin, Kevin, uh, his heart, you know, couldn't, couldn't take it anymore. And, and uh, he passed away that day. So what we learned from that again, is that, um, you know, you have to, yeah, it's, it's, it's not just a, about eating, right. Not just about being physically fit. It's a whole package deal that we need to be ready for the firefight. And again, um, kind of like that, the stress, the stress, um, the stress it's stuff we're having going on in the fire service, um, you know, psychological stuff where, where it's, it's okay to be, to not be okay. Right. For that. The same kind of thing goes on with your health. If you guys, you know, recognize that someone needs help or, 
or uh, maybe they're putting on some weight or they're not, they're not keeping up on the fire, right? It's time, maybe just like we would with the psychological stuff and check in on our people. We should check in on our people when it comes to this as well. So DC's kind of done that. Uh, after this, like Scott said, this was definitely a, um, um, a shaker, right? A baby shaker. And, uh, and, and it kind of said, look, this isn't, something's not right here. Our poster child just died of a heart attack. And, and it could probably happen to anybody. So fortunately, uh, they went out, they investigated some stuff, and they, they hooked up with the O2X group. Uh, and that's we've also got some O2X guys on here today to kind of talk about that. Connor Freeland, Ryan Glaze are here with us, too, to talk about that. Um, let me go to that. Connor, you want to uh, give us a little uh, introduction, who you are and um, what you're going to do for us? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So um, really excited to have uh, everybody here. I'm, I'm really excited that we have the ability to get on here and even just chat with you guys about this. But um, we were able to come into uh, the uh, DC Fire and EMS about October of last year and start implementing our program. Um, and we are a company that really bases our holistic approach of health and wellness around three things, which is um, our three pillars of eat, sweat and thrive. So it's not just getting in the weight room and, and lifting and working out. It's not just getting outside and running. You know, um, it's not just getting in the kitchen and making making sure that you're you're eating well and you're having a really um, really good nutritional meal. It's it's three three different places where you're getting in the kitchen and you're trying to look at what you're consuming every single day. You're also taking care of your body and working out, but you're taking care of what's kind of between the ears and from the neck up. You know, and that's our our thrive piece where you're understanding what what stress mitigation is and, and uh, our mental resiliency that we try to preach and, and, and hopefully instill in some people. That's huge. You know, I, and I think that's that's a big component of the program. But so we like I said, we've been here since October um, and trying to grow the program as much as possible. Um, and it's almost frustrating uh, to actually hear all these different things about Kevin and um, Ryan Glaze is also with me. And, and um, I know he'll introduce himself here soon. But um, just kind of riding off of what we just listened to, uh, we've heard a lot of stories about Kevin um, from being around a lot of the guys we've met that we've built relationships with. And we've heard nothing but good stories that he is the poster child. Um, and it, it's crazy to think about some of the guys that we've met and and if if that guy was him or vice versa. And, and I almost wish that we could have done something beforehand. But now that we are here, that we do have the program, um, kind of ride this and, and do as much as we possibly can to make sure something like this doesn't happen to a guy as good as Kevin that was a poster child, that was a selfless leader. So that's the goal of the program is to come in and, and like like uh, Hudson said, even if it's one person, make a change and, um, and kind of keep going on with that, build the group from there. So um, I'll let Ryan introduce himself as well. We just hired him in January. He's been a prehab specialist and strength conditioning specialist as well. Done a phenomenal job. So um, go, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah. Um, again, thanks for having me on. Um, Connor, he was the first guy in with O2X and hats off to Connor. I mean, he walked in and first guy on the ground and laid the groundwork for us and, you know, really did a lot of the, the hard work up front. So, you know, when I came in, um, the O2X introduction was kind of already made with the department and I kind of came in and followed what Connor's already talked about, you know, just where do we start, right? Like we have a huge, a huge department, um, a lot of big goals, but you know, where do we realistically start and how can we immediately start making change? And that's where, you know, we're, we're at the training Academy working with the recruits, cadets, you know, and still in that um, eat, sweat, thrive mentality um, from the jump. And, I think that's a great place to start. We definitely have big goals that, you know, we'll talk about. And, um, but yeah, just happy to be here. Happy to be with O2X and have a chance to, to uh, impact, impact the department. So you say you're at the training school, right? So um, this is tough because we definitely had some, uh, some years there where, um, you know, PT training was kind of off limits. Um, right. I mean, and, and, it, it pained. I was there then. And, you know, we, we met such resistance as far as trying to get in and, and, and do some formal stuff. Um, I, and I get it right. There's eight, there's only so many hours in a day that you get and you need to get into firefighting. Right. But but 
probably, and we, we just saw, right, with Kevin, one of the biggest parts of this is being physically fit. And, and, and it's a mindset thing. If you don't start that, right, because I, I know from training firefighters, the mindset starts at the academy too, right? The mindset starts for firefighting at the academy. So why wouldn't the mindset start for, for being fire fit at the academy too? That's, that's a great point. And, and that was the reason why we wanted to really entrench ourselves at the academy to try to um, not only implement the program to everybody, but to almost start um, tweaking the culture to really make sure that each recruit that came in, they understand that the job demands a lot from you. And for you to be the most effective, the most efficient firefighter, there's a lot that takes that takes place there. So we try to make sure that we're, we're walking them through PT or what we call injury prevention and progressively moving them up so that they have the ability to adapt and they have the ability to recover well, because what research shows us and what science shows us in just time overall is that you have to be able to recover properly to even get at adaptation. So we try to teach them things that we've learned from our backgrounds in collegiate athletics and a couple other places to, to actually have them leave and understand that as they go. You know, we don't want to just hammer them down for four to five months and then them leave and then they get back to, okay, I can do whatever I want now. I can eat whatever I want now. That's, that's not the purpose. It's, it's putting them through the program physically, but also allowing them to get educated in how they can take care of themselves moving forward, how they can be the best firefighter moving forward. Um, and it's it's been awesome to be at the academy. We've had a phenomenal amount of support. I mean, anything anything we need, we have a lot of guys that we can rely on. So it's it's been awesome. And, and I think we got a really good program right now. We're running through three different recruit classes, a cadet class. And um, seen a lot of progress so far. So yeah, it's 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 been awesome to be at the academy. Yeah. So what, what? How do we? How do we get these get these kids to think right? Because the firefighting part is is a tiny part of our of our gig, right? You, you guys, collegiate athletics. As much as we want to compare, you knew when the game was, right? But you knew when you were going to do that. And 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 our job, just like Kevin, right? Kevin. Kevin was, was at a fire at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, uh, we talked to, uh, to guys last, last month, the basement fire thing again, you know, that you can't predict when you're going to go to a fire. So how can we, how can we drill into these guys that it's not a matter of, of, of like, all right, let's go stretch, get ready. We're going to get a fire. We have to be fit. We have to be ready all the time. Right. Absolutely. And that's, uh, go ahead. Um, you made it, you made a great point though, you know, that in collegiate athletics, you know, when the game is right, you have a very set schedule, um, you know, practice, I mean, even practice training, it's all laid out in this pretty little schedule that never changes, right? Well, in this world, every day is game day, you know, and you don't know when that game is. And if you're not ready, there could be, you know, serious consequences for it. Um, so that makes it even more important really than athletics. Like you, you have to treat, um, your physical, your mental and um, nutrition preparation, seriously, because you don't know. It's not like I'll, I'll do it in three months when the big fire is, you know, you have no idea when that big fire is. So that's even more the reason to, you know, instill that, um, that mentality early and, and never let it slack off and, you know, not, not killing yourself, beating yourself down so much with training, but just holding yourself to a standard. You know, this job isn't for everyone. It's a very demanding um, physically, mentally, mentally demanding job. And, you know, you need to know that coming in and kind of treat it um, accordingly. So uh, I, I guess that's the, that's the problem though, right? Is that um, the, you say the job's not for everyone. <laughs> how do we, um, you know, how, <laughs> I mean, we want everybody to, to succeed though. Right. right. So uh, can you, you know, are you teaching skills that that they can that they that they're going to come from, you know, a, a not a tactical athlete to become a tactical athlete? Sure, um, and that is you. You would be surprised, right? And just like again, you know, in athletics, you have that scrawny freshman, right? That you're like, man, this guy would never. He'll never see the field. He'll never play. And then he puts in that hard work. He 
um, takes his training seriously. Next thing you know, he's a stud, right? And it's the same exact same uh, thing. Connor and I see it all the time, right? With recruits who really embrace what they're going through and embrace what we have to offer. And they come, they come out at the end of it, you know, miles ahead of where they were, you know, and I think they, they appreciate that. They understand, like, I wouldn't have gotten here had I not taken this seriously. Um, so it's not a matter of, um, you know, well, I could never be at that level. It's a matter of, okay, I'm going to hold myself accountable to get to that level. Yeah. And I think starting off really setting a standard early for the recruits and the cadets, we've been able to show them, all right, you're going to be here once you leave. And luckily now they have classes in front of them that they can see, okay, they're, let's say, for example, um, like one class is running a tower up and down and they're getting up and down in 59 seconds, right? And that's all your turnout gear on, STBA rolling, air's coming through, right? And it's, it's, it's almost like crazy to see a group that started out running, let's say, a minute and 40 seconds with no gear on up and down and they're gassed at the end of it. So for them to see that progress in front of them and then for us to track as many metrics as we do and to give them that kind of feedback – I think they see that they have the potential they can get there and then they have people that have done it before them. So it's a realistic goal and, and they have a good amount of time. So I think teaching them the different body mechanics that we do, the, the, the proper mechanics on things gives them some confidence. They make small strides in the beginning and then they just roll with it from there. So um, yeah, you, you really would be very surprised with some of the people that come out um, and, and a lot of that, as, as all of you guys know, um, you know, you can come in and as long as you're, you're going to give a hundred percent effort every day, your work ethics there, and, and you got some heart, man, like I've seen some, some people who show up and, and day one, I'm like, they're not making it. There's no way they're going to make it. And then, you know, halfway through or midway through they're the platoon leader or they're the captain of their company, you know, and they just had it or they had something that was different. And that's why they're getting better and better every week. So, um, yeah, it's it's different, you know, having as many people as we do. And, and um, it's it's uh, it's you know, you never know who you're going to get. Have you been able to, like, work in uh, firefighting gear and stuff? I mean, because, right, you guys, your background is not the firefighting stuff. Right. So you probably had to get like loaded up. on um, These are the things that we do. Right. These are the movements that we're going to do. Was there was there some some did you have to go through some training to kind of understand, you know, what we're what we do? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we actually did. So um, got to be in a couple of ride alongs. Um, you know, we got to see a lot of drills done um, at the fire academy out on the fire grounds. We were able to go through um, a bunch of different burns, I think maybe six or seven different evolutions. So we were able to get inside all the gear, be on air, see what it feels like. Um, we've ran towers on air. Um, and so we've done as much as we can to prepare ourselves for what it feels like to do the job. Um, we've never been in that high stress situation where your heart rate's pounding, um, and, and, you know, time is ticking, but we've done everything physically that we can to prepare ourselves and to understand what they go through. And we tell them that, you know, we, we they see us doing it. We explain that we've done this to them. Um, and that was kind of, of the first few months. What we wanted to do is understand what they go through, um, kind of get as relatable as possible to that. And not only that, but the feedback from other people was awesome. You know, we, we would constantly ask them, what is this like? What is that like? Hey, do you mind if we try this? And everybody's been unbelievably receptive and has allowed us to be in skill drills and has allowed us to do a lot of things so that we understand what it feels like. Again, minus stress, but what it feels like to go through a couple of these things, you know, the, the weight of certain things, all that's been really, really important. So we've been able to use about as much gear as possible in all of our PT and injury prevention programs. So, um, you know, I think now the, the recruit class that's currently there, that's, I guess, the farthest along in our program is 395. And the feedback that we've gotten from the officers that come over and help with burns, they're like, wow, like, there's a lot of these guys that are really fast, like they're a lot faster than we thought they would be. And um, you know, they're not as exhausted as we thought they would be. And I think it's because, um, you know, the, the instructors at the academy, um, the program has really developed them to be a lot more prepared for the physiological demands of what they're doing. So it's been awesome. Like it's, it's really creative too. You get to do a lot of cool things with, you know, hose line and, and all the different tools they have to carry. It's awesome. So um, yeah, we get as creative as possible with the gear. You talked about the resilience stuff, right? 
how um how kind of are you injecting that how do you you know work on resilience with people yeah well um you know the resiliency comes from just being exposed to stress right and then okay this is stress how do i respond right and just like what goes on at the academy you have those the first burns uh the recruits probably go in you know how hearts probably pounding nervous um sweating you know just kind of just adrenaline rush right and then the next one maybe a little less the next one maybe a little less right so there you, you kind of build that resiliency by just being exposed to it and that's what Connor and I try to do is expose them to physical stress and then get them to um, not only just get through it but to conquer it and then at the end of it um, you know that's where we kind of throw in some thrive stuff some breathing like okay uh, mental resiliency right like here's how you get your heart rate to come back down right here's how to kind of keep your wits about you and not let that adrenaline rush take over and you um, can still operate at a high level. Scott, um, I, I know this was a, a tough thing, right. To kind of get, to get the department to, to move forward with, but um, obviously they've added it to, to our budget, to the future. Um, how uh, um, is it, um, <laughs> How are they uh, funding this? Um, is it, again, are we taking it to incumbent members or is it just right now uh, with the recruits? So uh, that's a good question. And uh, to your point, Tony, yeah, it was ridiculously difficult to get this through. Um, and we were fighting three things, right, um, when we got this. And, and like I said, Kevin was the catalyst, I think, for this. Uh, you know, at the time I wasn't the union president, I was on the board. Uh, the union president at the time uh, said, we got to make a change, right? This can't happen again. Obviously, unfortunately, um, you know, you can never predict the future, but we need to do whatever we possibly can uh, to see what we can do to stop this. And it was kind of like, a, you know, what's out there? What are the programs? What can we do? But uh, we were fighting three things, I would like to say. We were fighting the troops, we were fighting the bosses, and we were fighting the budget. Um, and when I say that, when you walk into a firehouse and tell guys you want to bring a workout program and the first thing they say is, you know, get out of here. Don't tell me what I need to do. You know, I'm not fat. I'm not out of shape. You know, I can still do this job. Right. There's more to it than just that. Um, that slide you had up earlier, I was looking at it and the, the more of this stuff we kind of get into, the more uh, I, I think the, the dark horse in this whole thing is sleep. You had that up there um, in, in sleep, the recuperative values of sleep and what it does for you, uh, both mentally and physically, I think are, is going to be, as we go down this road, one of the things that uh, we undervalued the most. Uh, but when you put all of these things together, the better diet, the losing the weight, the working out, your sleep improves, and it helps all those other things exponentially, right? So trying to get guys to understand that uh, this isn't going to be punitive, right? That's the first thing everybody thinks is, you know, screw this, you're not going to fire me because I'm out of shape, right? Or I'm not going to get retired because I'm out of shape. Um, so trying to change everybody's outlook on this, that it's it's not going to be something that's punitive, but it's going to be lifestyle changes that we all need to make. And in my position as the union president, you know, I'm responsible for your health and safety. I'm responsible for your pension. I'm responsible to make sure that you get to get as much out of that pension as you possibly can, right? Those are the things that a lot of people lose um, sight of. And if we can do these things on the front end, or middle of your career, towards the end of your career, to make you understand that, make you see that, make you kind of make a few life changes that are gonna give you um, not only on the job, but after you retire, a good quality of life for uh, yourself and your family are huge. So getting the troops to buy in uh, was a big part of it. Getting the bosses to buy in, and I, I don't wanna say getting them to buy in, um, but there's only been so much money in the budget, right? And I'm asking for a big piece of the budget because doing these things aren't cheap. I originally went in and uh, we were asking for over a million dollars a year. Um, and I got laughed at, you know, we, we all got laughed at, like, you know, we can't, we can't buy new fire trucks. We can't buy new air packs. We can't buy uniforms. Um, now you want me to take a million bucks out of my budget to try and do this and trying to show a value to the program. Um, and we were fortunate that O2X had done some significant work in Boston, Boston fire department. Uh, and they had some, uh, some numbers that helped and they put together a presentation for us where the, the Boston Fire Department invested a million dollars in their first year, and they saw a four and a half million dollar reduction in lost time from uh, work, uh, return to work programs, you know, a lot of the things that were plaguing their members. 
So when we were able to change the narrative to this is something that's going to cost the department to this is going to be a revenue generator to the department because we're going to get these employees back sooner. Maybe we can get the guys in working out and doing some recovery type stuff or rehabilitation stuff with a personal trainer that keeps them from having that $250,000 shoulder surgery in the six months out of work or the knee replacement or the hip replacement. You know, these things that we were seeing or God forbid uh, a heart attack or, or uh, any of those things. And this kind of dovetailed at the same time we were fighting for presumptive language, right? Um, and we were successful in getting our presumptive language. We got some cancers and some, uh, you know, uh, cardiac uh, issues covered. But you can't sit there and say, cover my troops when they have one of these issues if I'm not doing anything to prevent them from having these issues, right? So we had to sell it as a whole package. And I don't want to say sell it because I believe in it. Uh, we wouldn't have brought something to the table that we didn't believe in. So once we could package this together and say, look, you're going to save money. It made it easier than to go and, and put that first ask in. Well, what does anybody say in your manager's positions? Like, that's great. Find the money. We'll get it. We'll put in for a grant, right? We're going to get a grant and it's going to be great. Um, so we were able to, to get some money together through our risk management division to do um, one uh, workout uh, excuse, uh, session. And it was a week-long class. Uh, it was a workshop that we put together. Um, and we, we put people from all walks of life in the fire department. Um, you're laughing to say it's big, small, skinny, you know, male, female, white, black, everybody, every, everybody you could possibly think of. We had every group and we put them in there and the feedback was 99% positive, right? It's the only training class. Everybody goes to a training class or a research class in the fire department. They try and sleep as much as they can, get out as fast as they can and get it over with for the next two years, right? That's what we do. That's what everybody says. The feedback was unbelievable. Everybody that was in there um, truly enjoyed it. And, and the thing then was, you know, we want you to work out in a, I don't know, was it a two foot box or whatever? Like, we'll give you some things you can do with body weight, learn how to eat, learn how to sleep, learn how to de-stress. Um, I mean, when have you ever been to a class in the fire department where we had guys and gals doing yoga, right? You know, they would have laughed at you, uh, but everybody loved it. So that made the sell a little bit easier and we were able to step the money um, and, and we were fortunate that our council members jumped in and they funded the program for us because um, the fire department, and this is not a shot at the fire department, but they didn't see as much value in it as we did. So we were able to get some of the funding um, through the city council and we've able to step it up every year. So with every increase in budget we get, we're trying to add more and more programs uh, that would benefit the members. Right. And um, it's not an easy fight. It's, it's tough because, uh, you know, uh, um, Along with that, we're trying to change some of our physical fitness standards and the things that we have to do in the district, right? But when we do that, we also don't want that to be punitive. We want to be able to give people the opportunity to better themselves, um, you know, and to have programs that will put them in the position that they can excel. Um, so it's a, it's kind of a, I think Connor started it earlier when he said it's a holistic approach, right? You got to look at your physical fitness standards. You got to look at your annual physicals. You got to look at the the people that you're serving and what your responsibilities are to them. You got to value engineer that against a budget. And I hate to say that because you can't put a dollar figure on somebody's life, but that's what we end up doing, right? You only have a certain piece of the pie. So when you can get it started, show the benefits, the reduction in you know, people being out of work and the savings to the department, it makes it significantly easier to fund the programs going forward. It has not been an easy uh, road to get here. We started probably six or eight years ago. Um, you know, I was talking to Paul, one of the co-founders of O2X was in town yesterday uh, and we met and we were we were kind of joking about where we are now versus where we thought we would be or where we even started. I never thought we would have two full time hires, um, would never have the guys and gals in the street reaching out to them to come into the firehouses to talk about, um, you know, the programs. And it's funny. Somebody sent me a picture. Everybody will laugh when I say this. It was a, you know, one of the typical firehouse tables, right? The long sitting room table. And there's like five or six guys huddled talking. I think Connor, you were in there. And there's the one guy at the end of the table eating like a foot long cheesesteak, right? You know, like that's just what it is. But, you know, you talk to the company officer and, you know, after you watched everybody else start doing it, then that guy got in, right? So, you know, you never want to say peer pressure works, but peer, peer pressure works, right? You know, if you get a couple people in the firehouse uh, just to start doing a workout or, you know, eat a cleaner meal, cook a little bit healthier, um, do that, you know, take, do one or two things. You know, that was one of the things in the workshop that came out. You don't have to do it all. You're not going to get into this program and be a world-class athlete six weeks later. Right. But do one or two things, you know, eat one less Twinkie a day and, you know, one more banana. I mean, I hate to say that, but like all those little things, if you can step it over time are going to benefit you. And um, 
I think the guys have done a great job at, at doing it. We're still – COVID screwed everything up. I can't lie. We had workshops uh, planned, you know, where we're going to put people together, and that's where – we were fortunate enough to turn some of the money we had for workshops into hiring uh, Brian and getting him in. Um, but that, that, that was a struggle. We're still struggling. I, I still want to get a million dollars a year to do this. I'm hopeful that in this budget cycle we'll get a little bit more so we can we can do some more things. Once we get a million, I'm going to ask for two million. Uh, see if we can get, you know, just keep uh, putting up there. Because I do think people are starting to understand that. And I do think that there's a, a transition or a shift in the fire service where people are starting to look at the long-term um health problems that our troops are facing cancers heart disease all these things and seeing where we can change some of the things that we do um you know everybody wants to look at ppe and fire trucks and gear and you know that stuff but a simple workout going into this app and, and downloading a workout downloading a meal taking a look at stuff and seeing what you could do 20 30 minutes a day is going to have a significantly bigger impact on your life than a lot of those other things uh, that you talked about earlier so that was a really long-winded answer to your question you've worked with me long enough to know i was going to do that so uh i hope that answered your question right if i didn't want you to talk i shouldn't have invited you right so um i mean a couple of things that I, I took from your uh diatribe there was that um you know a lot of guys when you get burned one time what do you do you, you learn how to put your hood on differently right you practice that unfortunately if a guy has one heart attack he may not survive that. Correct. Or fortunately, right, we know um, the, our health system is pretty good. So some of these things are, 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 are survivable. So maybe, maybe when somebody does survive it, they'll, they'll, they'll change some of their, some of their uh, uh, ways that they do things and they'll, 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 they'll adjust, right? But we want to try and avoid that, right? We don't want to touch the iron. We don't want to, we don't want to have a small heart attack because that's not going to be, not going to be good. But that was so that's some of the tough things, just like the cancer thing. Right. It's tough because we don't have it's tough to get guys to believe that cancer kills because we're not having guys come back from a fire and drop dead with cancer. Nope. So it's tough to have a, it's tough. It's tough for a guy to equate eating that biscuit to a heart attack because he's not dropping dead right after he eats the biscuit or whatever. Right. So, yeah. I mean, that's why it's, it's so tough and it's it's not. It's a marathon, right? It's not. Um, it's not going to be a quick turnaround. That was one of the it's best things. Be. So hopefully, oh, go ahead. From the workshop that we did, and the nutritionist was in there. We had a nutritionist for like four or five hours. Was, she was great. She was like, you know, how many people think eating cakes bad? Everybody raises their hand, right? She's like, eating cakes not bad. Eating cakes bad when you eat a whole cake every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? Like, all of this stuff is in moderation, not to the extreme, and that's the important part, right? Like. Guys, when you reach out to them and do one of these things, they think you're going to jam all the stuff down their throat, make them eat spinach for every meal. You know, you can't have fun. Don't ever have a drink. You can't do this. You can't do that. And that's not what it is. It's about making conscientious lifestyle changes, doing the little things consistently uh, that are going to lead to a healthier lifestyle, which are ultimately going to help you reduce your injury and hopefully get way more out of retirement than you ever put into your into your job. And I go back. I was thinking about when you just said that. Uh, we had another guy that fortunately wasn't a line of duty death, but Bronco, one of our guys that retired, uh, he was retired on a disability because he had a heart issue. Um, and our disability retirement system, this isn't a shot at the city, but it's terrible. We're working to try and fix it. Um, he lost his whole quality of life, right? Like, I mean, it was just terrible. Um, a guy that was 18 months away from retirement, from taking a full retirement, had his whole world flipped upside down. Um, was it job related? Probably. Did we have presumptive then? No. You know, would things have been different today? Possibly. Um, but maybe if we'd had O2X 35, 40 years ago, um, you know, or something like that, that brought the attention to that. So it's not just like everybody looks at the guy that dies. And I mean, Kevin, like I said, was a shot across the bow because he was just he was that guy. He was so personal, such a, you know, in your face, just awesome dude. But then you go back and look at some of these other guys that have been affected as well and gals um, that haven't that fortunately haven't died, but have just had their life completely wrecked because of one medical uh, emergency that could it have been prevented? Who knows? Um, hopefully I'd like to think with some of the other things we've implemented with our, um, you know, stress tests and some of those things, um, we would have caught some of these things in annual physicals, but uh, you know, it, it, that, sorry, that's my, my diatribe, as you said earlier, just uh, some of the things that came well, out. I mean, another, another thing, the other thing too, is that it, we know, right. It's a busy system. We got, we got companies running 5,000 runs a year, right? We got 15 companies running that many. 
So it's unfortunately it's going to be tough to, for you to work, to get a workout in at work. Right. I guess that's why it's also going to, we need to get guys to understand that, you know, the shift is conducive to you taking some time on your day off. Right. It's an investment. Again, it's, it's not, that's you the, need to come to work to go on runs and, and go to the calls for serving. That's the biggest argument I get is I don't even have time at work to work out. And, you know, when I was at truck 13, I mean, a 10 engine, one of the busier firehouses in the country, the wagon driver used to always work out. He might get interrupted 15 times, but he would go get on the elliptical and try and get his 30 minutes in. Right. And, and that's the hardest sell. And as the union president, I get it. People will come to me to try and get workout time at work. But a lot of places we are, we just don't have that. We just don't have that. Right. You just can't do it because there's so much other stuff we have to do during the day but it is about a lifestyle change and doing it on your days off because that is going to give you a better quality of life you know as you retire in your whole career i mean there there have been times that we've been i would say eight or nine different houses and that's happened i mean we've been in the middle of a workout and people have had to leave because a call happens but they come back and most of the time you know we're still working out we're stretching working on mobility or something but sometimes the workouts still run in, they hop back in and run. So it's, it's possible. I know there's a lot of places that you're constantly getting banged out just from calls over and over and over, but um, you still got the opportunity to do it. And I think he really hit it right on the head. Like your days off, you know, that first day might be a wash. You're still exhausted from that, from that, that tour, but those next two days, like there's, there's definitely a good possibility that you can work 30 to 45 minutes in from your day to do something to make sure if you put 25 years in, you get 25 years out when you're done. So that's, I think that's really important. I think um, you said it. Everybody said it. Everybody has said, do something, right? Again, it's not, you don't have to go out and join a gym. You don't have to go CrossFit. You don't have to eat quinoa and spinach every day, right? Just do something. Um, again, you can have a donut in moderation. You can have a cake. You can have that. You can have a beer, you know, but just don't go, don't go crazy. And, um, and, and, you know, look out for each other too, right? Again, Kevin had a lot of uh, underlying medical conditions there that, um, you know, if, if who knows, right? We can all sit back and say, what if? Um, but un unfortunately, we can, we can now say, what if I take the stairs? We know what the kind of investment in your body that is, right? What if I, what if I um, work out today, right? What if, I, what if I get some good sleep? I go to bed early. These are all things that, that what if are good things. So, you know, work on some of them. So, um, Connor, Ryan, uh, we can talk more about this. And I think that, you know, we may have to do something again um, another time. Uh, we probably maybe next February. February is Heart Health Month. And um, this last February, we talked about apparatus maintenance. And the apparatus was your cardiac apparatus. Um, so, you know, maybe we can um, hit some of that stuff again next February with heart health, or, um, you know, we can get something in um, later on the year uh, with another May Day, May Day Monday. Scott, I really appreciate you coming on. I want to, I want to, we're going to switch over here and talk about the skill drill. Let me get my, share my screen. Every month, right, we uh, try to give everybody a skill drill to go out and, and perform to practice so that uh, you're ready for the situation. This month's skill drill, firefighter CPR. Again, it's a horrible thought that we have to do CPR on one of our own. But it's, it's important that we practice this. Um, it's important that we practice this, that we're able to get, we can start compressions, we can get early access, quick access, and we can do quality CPR. Everybody knows the, the value of quality CPR. Heck, we're even uh, teaching people how to do hands-only CPR. Civilians, right? We're teaching how to do that. Uh, we know the pit crew thing, how well that that's works out. Again, the success for quality CPR. The same thing goes uh, for us and this and quality CPR on firefighters. So when you get the uh, this month's May Day Monday, uh, when you look at the uh, the links that are in there, you'll find one for this this CPR example. This is a DCR recruit DCFD recruit class. Uh, they they perform this. Um, again, when I was at the school, the, these, this recruit class came up and said, hey, we've got some ideas on how to do this CPR. Here's just a quick, a quick uh, look at this. They went in. We uh, actually had set up a scenario where they were bringing somebody out of a burn building. Um, and then how are we going to start CPR? Again, 
Um, you know, get in, get in, do your pit crew thing. Uh, this is going to take you through the steps. You'll find, you will find uh, this video attached to this month's Mayday Monday. Uh, again, you can also go on YouTube and search DC Fire and EMS if you want to go that way. But the link is on there. There's also, also in uh, the this month's Mayday Monday is the link to the NIOSH report. This will give you a lot of information uh, about Kevin, about his underlying medical conditions, talks a little bit about the incident and uh, what you can learn from that. So please get out there, get out there, do the skill drill, send me some pictures, uh, send me some pictures of you and your crew doing the skill drill. All right. Cause we'd like to like to send that out and show people how, uh, how we're getting ready. We're practicing so that we're ready. If this is to happen in our, in our fire department, uh, Connor, uh, Ryan O2X is, uh, looks like a great thing. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to participate with you guys at O2X in DC. Cause I got like five days left and I'm working in DC fire department. Um, and then, uh, we're going to move somewhere else. So maybe we can bring you O2X to my new fire department. Uh, Scott, thanks for coming on. Um, I thought I had enough of you this past weekend, but, but you came on and, uh, we, we got to talk some more. Hey, I appreciate uh, having the opportunity, Tony. And if uh, anybody that's out there is listening, has any questions, sorry, I got my daughter here. If anybody has any questions or, uh, wants to reach out about, uh, how we got O2X or any of that in, or some of the things that we did, cause, um, We've really shown some value from it. And I think a lot of other places have. Please, my email is dabney.hudson at iaff36.org. Uh, give me a shout. I'll send you my cell phone number, 202-441-4837. Uh, give me a call um, because it's definitely made an impact in our members' lives. And if I can help somebody else, uh, we're 100% in. Connor, uh, any last words from O2X? No, again, thank you for allowing us to get on here and talk to you. We'd love to come back and talk more. Um, I think we were just kind of getting started, getting into the the meat and potatoes of the program, what we've done here. So um, definitely looking forward to coming back on. And again, thank you again. Looking forward to, uh, to talking again. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having us on. Um, always, lines are always open. So any questions like that, please uh, reach out. All right. Uh, this month we're missing uh, Chief Halton. Chief Halton was away at a, um, a meeting. Actually, uh, just just dropped in oh, on you, Tony. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, guys. Uh, this is uh, Bobby Halton, the editor of Fire Engineering. Um, he's a, a great great help with the May Day Mondays, and uh, usually he's here. But again, the schedule we scheduled it late. He was he was kind of busy. So, uh, Bob, we were talking about um, heart health a little bit. We touched on that. We touched on. Um, the O2X has got, you know, a whole, um, a whole uh, three, they have a three pronged approach, right? What was it? Eat, thrive and survive. I've known the and O2X we were talking to them. since uh, the very beginning when they're out in Boston, Ryan and uh, Adam and uh, Paul are friends of mine. Um, they're great guys. I, I, I'm glad I saw Ryan and Connor repping for the brand with the shirts on. That's yeah. excellent. Always repping for the brand. I, I can unequivocally endorse O2X. I do it without any hesitation. It's, it's one of the best programs out there. I've watched them do incredible things at several major fire departments. The, the caliber of the men and women that work there are unparalleled. Bryce is another dear friend of mine, uh, has been working with O2X for, for quite a while now. Um, Tony, it's just a group of men and women that really understand the mission. They understand the importance of wellness, spiritual, physical, emotional, uh, and, and they go above and beyond in, in treating everybody, not as, a, uh, not as someone to push through the system, but an individual to help bring their life together in, in a more meaningful way, not just with the job, but every aspect of your life gets better with O2X. Um, it's, a, it's just a great, great organization. It's a great, great company. It's a, a fantastic program. Um, you know, I, I hope that in your new job tony that you can that you can get paul and, and adam out there um you know they're 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 wonderful guys former navy which i think is a, a very important you know it's the only important thing about them i'm kidding my, my son full disclosure my son's a commander in the navy and uh, so i have got I'm, I'm prejudiced as hell plus uh plus adam and uh I, I real quick story adam and paul are just starting this thing out they're giving this big presentation in boston fire park i'm in the audience and they mentioned that where they worked. I don't know if, it's, if you guys mentioned that, but they're former SEALs. So 
I was friends with their commander, Rear Admiral Moore. He's a buddy of mine. So I call up Scotty Moore while, while they're giving their little presentation. And I said, give me the gouge on these two characters. You know, that they, were they squared away? What's the deal? And he lays it out. Two of the most squared away seals he ever had. Just waxes poetic about these guys. And Scott is not that kind of guy. He, he, he literally begged Adam not to leave. He said he got, he, he was that impressed with Adam LaRue. So, and he had never done that before in his career. That, that is not, Scott Moore is a seal seal. He's, he, he takes iron supplements and he shits nails. This guy is as tough as it gets. He's alpha male all the way, right? So when I'm, when I'm hearing this, I'm like, okay, I, I don't care what these kids are selling, I'm buying, you know? And I went up to a couple of my buddies at the time who were, you know, in there and I said, watch this. <laughs> so they don't know, they, you know, they don't have a clue who I am. And I walk up and I, I've got, I've got their DD 214s in my back pocket from, from Scotty. Right. And they're like, looking at me, who is this dude? You know, and how do you know that? And, and they were just, they were wonderful and they've been wonderful. They've presented at FDIC. They come out every year. Um, they get it. You know, they, they understand it's a competition to, to submit there and to present there. And um, they work hard at making sure that what they do there is digestible and usable. It's not a sales pitch, you know? And so um, you, you'll, never, you'll never regret spending a moment with O2X, honest to God. Um, and, and, and what's cool about it is, you know, I'm a 66 year old man. You, you could be a 26 year old guy or a 66 year old guy, and they're gonna, they're gonna help you work through a system that's gonna make you better every day that works for you. So you win all day with O2X. That's all I got to say. So thank you guys for being here and, and thank you for what you're doing for the fire service because it really is important and it makes wellness a lifetime um, habit. You know what I mean? Uh, and it's gotta become a lifetime habit. And there's gonna be ebbs and flows. Maybe everybody's gonna get the dad bod from time to time because there are times when not going to the gym is the right thing to do. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, uh, yeah, unless you want to sleep on the couch for months. So, yeah. you know, so, but they, but they get all that, right? And even when you're dealing with that, there's things you can do at home and you, you, know, you do your crunches, your leg lifts, you can do, you, know, you can do all kinds of stuff that you, that O2X can help you get through. And, and then, and then the dietary stuff is un unbelievable. And, and then just the emotional, you know, the, the emotional stuff that they do. So thank you guys for being, I can't, I want to thank you. And, and, and Tony, I want to thank you. Um, these are really important, you know, uh, after action reports, AARs are never gonna give us all the ammunition we need for the next event. But what they are gonna give us is another slide in the slide tray to help us to know to avoid at least some of the, you know, issues that, that precluded. In a dynamically complex environment, you can control nothing, but you can influence everything. And, and that's what these AARs that you're doing, after action reviews, you know, these, these Mayday Mondays, that's what they're doing for the fire service. You're, you're giving us another arrow in the quiver so that we can be better than we were yesterday, better than we were this morning. So, and, and uh, I really enjoyed seeing that. How old, how old is she? How old's your daughter? She just turned one, so. Uh, man, man, you are winning, man. You are winning. Yeah, I got my three-year-old son and my daughter running around here, so I'm trying to cook dinner and uh, do it all at the same time. But uh, man, that's, I remember those days, man. It, but I'm only 29, but I have three kids. That's why I'm, I'm just... 28. So really... <laughs> hey, you give it, don't give him any credit, Bobby. Don't, I mean, his, he's going to be like, uh, like his head's going to be big, bigger than it already is. You know, kids, kids don't are not like most stuff. There, there's no warranty and you can't return them. You know, no. it's, you're stuck. So no, and they put a whole new perspective on things, right? Like it completely makes you understand the value in this program too. Like uh, myself, it makes you, Kind of take a look inside and see what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, things you could change because you want to hang out with them for long after I'm off the job. You know, that was the unfortunate part where we started this talking about Kevin and his kids. Like you just you, you see the world in a different view. It's the most it's the most stunning reminder that the only good in life comes from doing things for other people. In other words, all the best things in my life always happened to me when I was doing something for somebody else. It was never, you know, and that's your children ground you there. And then it grows into mom and then it grows into fam and it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows until it's the poor guy on the side of the road with the sign out 
that calls you every Tuesday and you go and you take care of them, you know, and you bring them a little chow after chat, you know, after the chow run. And that's just who we are. And uh, well, I, I think that uh, I think about all the things that my kids do now that my parents aren't here to see. Right. And how how proud they would be of what the kids have become. So I want to I want to I want to be able to see as much as I can of the kids. Right. So, um, you know, whatever you got to do to live a long life. Right. Everybody calls you old. Nobody wants to die young. No, I no, want to live forever. Nobody, nobody's looking for the exits. No, no, nobody. The, and the best part is if you live as long as I have, you can watch their kid, your kids, kids torment them. And it's a beautiful thing. And you can show up with pockets full of Werther's originals and all kinds of sugar, load the kids up, and then just hand them back to mom and dad. <laughs> great, great, wow. thanks. Oh, it's awesome, man. It's yeah. awesome being a grandfather. So I think they're yours now. That's it. <laughs> Grandpa's got to go. Go back out to the trailer or the hotel. Bye bye now. <laughs> well, yeah, listen, so I, I don't want to keep you on too long, but the no, this is all in the interest of that, right? And um, yeah. one thing that um, I, I, when we finish with this, because you didn't get a chance to see it, but uh, this is the guy we were talking about. It kind of what you said about with um, with with uh, Colonel Moore, right? Uh, the, the 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 seal seal. Kevin was the was the fireman's fireman, and um, you know we 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 are we miss that. And again, what he could see if if he was here, he could see his kids excelling in the fire department. You know, and 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 again, just the delight you could take in in seeing seeing the things that he's kind of touched um, throughout throughout this fire service. So that was Kevin, um, and that this is kind of what got us into Mayday Mondays. What got me into it is there's so many people who didn't know much about Kevin. Right. I mean, there's there's a, there's eighteen hundred people who did. But now if they watch the main if they watch the podcast, if they look at the Mayday Monday, they'll know a little bit more about Kevin. And, and right, we said we would never forget. Well, let's never forget. Right. And the heart. Muscle so that's is, the Mayday Monday. The heart muscle is so important to care for, too. And, and with all the advanced screening we have today, please take advantage of that. You know, if your department affords you to be able to go get, you know, scans, life scans or whatever, to look at your heart, go do it. You know, don't don't ever pass up the opportunity to get a, a good thorough physical and, and try to do something every day for that cardiovascular. I mean, it's you know, it's nice if you look like, you know, Connor and Ryan here, like you just walked out of a Rocky movie as a stunt double. But, you know, irrespect. Yeah. No, irrespective of of of, of you know, God given natural size, you, your heart muscle, you, you can grow that muscle. And, and it's like every other muscle. It's like your brain. If you don't exercise it, it'll atrophy. You know, and we see that in politicians. They don't use it very often, and that's what we got. So I'll close on that one. Well said. <laughs> yeah. So, um, guys, again, thanks for coming. Bobby, uh, I see we're, we're getting closer and closer to uh, August. Huh? F FDIC is coming. I know Ryan and uh, I know Paul and Adam are coming out. I hope Ryan and Connor get to come with them. I know they're coming out to the show. So, I know O2X is going to be there, so look forward to seeing you guys. Um, please register early. I, you know, the hot classes when they fill up, they're full. I can't, I can't horn, you know, shoehorn you in there. They are what they are. They're limited, and and uh, writ under fire is going to fill fast. It's already uh, the pre-reg on writ under fire from two years ago was half the class capacity. So it's going to be really tough to get into that class. You got to register early. Downtown rooms will fill up fast, and there's nothing I can do for you. You know, you got it. You just got to register early and, and get there. It's going to be in August. So first week of August. So it's going to be packed. I mean, it's going to be insane. The fun run is Thursday night. I'll expect to see all of you there. The stair climb is Friday. I'll expect to see all of you there. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the physical activity stuff. The, the fool's bash is Wednesday night. I know I'll see all of you there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and the comedy night is still on. That'll be on Tuesday night. So all the regular stuff is going on. It's going to be wonderful. We're going to have a great time. So I'm looking forward to, you know, seeing everybody there. It, it's a, it, it's a wonderful thing to be part of. So, and, and, and O2X has been a big part of it for the last, boy, almost eight years now. It seems like eight, 10, since, since the very beginning, they came out the first year they hit the ground running. And, uh, so, you know, make sure you get a chance to, to visit with them and learn more about the program. Yeah, they'll, they'll be there. I'm, hopefully I'll be there. I got to make sure I got leave, you know, got a new job. I don't have much leave anymore. So 
Um, Got to get off of that. So the FNG, uh, that man. was our May Day Monday. <laughs> that was our May Day Monday for for May. Again, May 6, twenty fifteen. We lost Kevin. Um, there's other members in May that we want to remember too. Uh, this May Day Monday is dedicated to Kevin McRae and um, and his life in the DC Fire Department. So thanks everybody for coming. Uh, O2X, Scott, everybody, Bobby, thanks for, for making an appearance. And we'll see you next month uh, for more Mayday Monday. Thanks, Tony. Bye, everybody.